Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Ticket Pro Dome Hybrid Studios. After an unprecedented year, it's always excellent to get together, not only for a live event, but also just to socialize and, and personally interact with each other. At the Ticket Pro Dome, we've launched our hybrid studios. Uh, as, lo as everybody knows, uh, there's a need for us to start facilitating both virtual and hybrid events. We look forward to hosting you here at the Ticket Pro Dome. We've put up a setup that's permanent, that's always available, and it's something that you can come through and engage and book with us within 24 hours. You're welcome to contact me. My name is Neil Nagro, and I'm here based here at the Ticket Pro Dome. And every Wednesday, we set up a live hosting of this entire setup. So you're more than welcome to come through and have a chat to us. But the real reason everybody's here is to get an update from the industry. And it's my absolute pleasure to introduce to you, well, she needs no introduction, uh, but it's the chairperson of AXO, which is Progeny Patha. Uh, she's gonna come up through and she's gonna start the moderation. But as she comes up, we've got a highlights reel of what we've done here at the Ticket Pro Dome. And it's just, a, it's a one minute video of what we've done both live and hybrid and digital and virtual. So enjoy the highlights reel and we'll catch up with you a bit later. Three, two, one. A very good afternoon, everybody. Uh, a warm welcome to you on a cold, rainy day in Johannesburg. Um, I'm Progeny Patha, as you all know, chairperson of AXO, the Association of African Exhibition Organizers. Uh, welcome to our industry update as a hybrid session. So it's the first time we're doing a hybrid session. You'll normally see me in the comfort of my home with my very comfy, cozy slippers on, I'd say, <laughs> sitting behind my desk away from everybody. But today it's such a pleasure to be here amidst people, real people, live people. And it's an absolute pleasure to see all these faces today. And for those of you that couldn't join us, uh, we're sorry that you couldn't, but we know that you will join us next time. But you are joining us online anyway. And that is the way of the future. Firstly, I'd like to say a very big thank you to the Ticket Pro Dome uh, for giving us the honor of utilizing these studios today. It's an absolute privilege to be able to utilize it firsthand and experience it firsthand. It's quite nerve wracking because it's my first time doing this. I don't know about you guys, <laughs> gents. Um, but it is exciting and it's the way of the future, like we said, and it's something that we're all going to be getting used to. Um, talking to cameras and talking to my audience that are with me here today and talking to those of you that are here online as well as some of the panelists that we have online. Um, so colleagues, today we're taking the opportunity to highlight the state of the industry. Obviously it's been a year without work and many companies and individuals have hit rock bottom to date. Uh, but despite the lack of a confirmed reopening date, the SA Events Council have been fiercely lobbying government to ensure 
we're not a forgotten industry. Now, the SA Event Council, as many of you might know, is a collaboration of 14 event industry associations, and they all play a pivotal role in supporting, educating, and promoting the event industry at large. And most importantly, lobbying government during this very critical time in our industry's being, state of our existence, to ensure that we reopen soon. Today, we're going to get an honest update. I know that you've had received much communication from us. You follow us on social media, you've seen our news stories out there, thanks to our media publications that have been promoting our industry and lobbying um, government, lobbying the South African public and corporate South Africa to trust us to reopen uh, again. Today, I've invited three of our members of the South African Event Council, three of the members that I sit with on a weekly basis, that have been working really, really hard behind the scenes. Um, it's been a year, and a lot has happened. You might not have gathered all of it. You might have picked up um, little bits and pieces that we've put out in the media, and I think that's why we've decided that it's impo so important for us to engage at this level, talk about it, answer your questions, because that's what we're here for. We have nothing to hide. We want to work together with the industry to ensure that we reopen safely and we can reignite the South African economy. So today I have the privilege to be joined by Glenton de Kock from Saki. He's the CEO of Saki. Welcome, Glenton. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, and then we have Sharif Baker, and he's the consultant to TPSA, as well as a, the tech, a technical production manager, and I know he misses being on the field, in the field, a great deal. And joining us, because this is a hybrid event, we have the opportunity to do that, joining us from Cape Town, where unlike uh, the rest of the country, enjoying great weather, so I'm not sure how many people are online with us in Cape Town today, apparently it's 36 degrees out there, is Justin van Beek, and um, he represents SALPA, which is the South African Live Performance Association, and he's the managing director of Big Concerts South Africa. So welcome to you, Justin. Great to have you online with us. So, gentlemen, to kickstart the discussion, I'm not going to do all the talking today. Uh, these gentlemen, they do talk a lot, so they've asked me to... <laughs> put the brakes on when I can. But the, the thing is, they have so much to share because they've been working so hard to put the pieces of the puzzle together. And we really have so much to share with you. So, Glendon, I'm gonna start with you. Do you wanna give everybody some insight in terms of where your role is in us reopening the industry? Thanks, Prajin, and good afternoon to everybody. And as I always say, it's always good to see people um, because if we're talking too much or we're talking a bit of crap, we can actually see the reaction uh, versus somebody putting off um, the camera as such. So if we do go overboard, I know some of you that have worked with us will, uh, will obviously share that with you. But I think on the onset, I probably want to thank everybody out there, uh, in person or online, um, for two things. One, understanding that, that when we have done most of what we've done in terms of the work um, with colleagues has been with empathy. Because this particular pandemic, as I said before, affects us all differently, both personally and professionally. And second to that is, and I made this comment before we went on, on air, is that not only have associations come together, but also private sector companies who, who probably before the pandemic have never thought of working together. You know, so you always, we've always used this word collaboration within our sector, but I think collaboration in motion and action is something that we've achieved over time. Now, I know when we come, come to these sessions, the, the sort of three questions that I ask, the most important one at the moment now is the issue around UIFTERS. Um, as to where we're at on that. What I can feedback um, quite early in the conversation is that the system is being updated. Um, there were some serious concerns, I know, about two weeks ago in respect of the SIC codes as to how the company was originally registered. And across the board, what was then discovered was that your SARS SIC code wasn't speaking to the CETA SIC code, wasn't speaking to the UIFC code. So the system is currently being updated. Um, I was hoping that before I came online, I could have fed back some positive news to say, listen, the system will be updated by this evening or tomorrow morning going live. So what will happen now is that companies, once, once the system is updated, will be able to reapply. Um, and through the systems of drop-down boxes uh, with support information, you shouldn't have any assets going forward. Uh, but I caution, caution that because obviously 
we've seen throughout the year with, uh, with the support we've got through UIFTERS that at times the system has been a bit uh, temperamental. I mean, the and the second one is obviously when do we get back to business? Um, and and, and I've, I've said this before in that because we're almost in the southern hemisphere, we've got Europe to watch. And I think yes. we, we've seen what's happening in Germany over the last couple of days in terms of hard lockdown, then no lockdown, stop, start. But we've worked towards, and I'm sure Sharif has done the same in, in some of the areas he's been working, is stop, start doesn't help our sector. Um, and it doesn't help with planning either as well. So as much as we were gaining a momentum towards December, we've seen what's happened in stopping the industry abruptly, which effectively meant that the first and second quarter of the year, there's uncertainty. And that, that uncertainty is almost starting to creep into the third quarter. What I would encourage us all, including ourselves within the SA Events Council and our associations is, because we've got a year's worth of experience, the hope that we have is obviously the vaccine. And I think as civil society, we need to put pressure on government to get the vaccine here yes, sooner rather than later. Because I think we've still got enough time to save the fourth quarter and build for a good first quarter of 2022. Um, and I say that because we've got a year's worth of experience of what lockdown looks like, what the regulation looks like, and, and how we are going to effectively meet. Because at the moment we can do 100. We can probably only go back to 50. If we go back to level, level one in terms of the true sense like we were towards December, it would be 250 indoors. So I think that's sort of the frame that we have from government at the moment, which would allow us understanding the planning. But I think with the vaccine here, yeah, uh, we can then push the, uh, push the framework and push the envelope in terms of the numbers. So Quite I think briefly, point. just an introduction um, in terms of where we're at, those I think the areas I wanted to start off um, getting that onto the, onto the conversation immediately. Wonderful, thank you, thank you, Glenton. Um, Sharif on, 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 my, on, my, on my left, yes. Uh, so Glenton works very, hard, works very closely with the TBCSA, uh, as well as with the Department of Tourism. And um, so that's where he's able to give us feedback. Um, he's in regular conversations there, and he will give us more feedback because we've got quite a few questions coming up through uh, that we need answered. And people want answers to. I think the UIFTERS one in particular has been a big bugbear for everyone. Now, Sharif, on the other hand, works with the Department of Sports, Arts, and Culture. And uh, he has been appointed to chair the uh, ministerial advisory committee, I got that right, team, team. <laughs> advisory team. You want to give us a little bit about background in terms of what you're going to be sharing with us today? Yeah, um, good afternoon colleagues and everybody seated and seated at home. Thank you for the opportunity and I think this is a great initiative for us to get together as the SA Events Council and people in the know of communicating the information that we have on hand and how we've been working with the different government departments. Um, we've been fortunate that it's taken 332 days of constant communication with the department that has now come to fruition where a select group of us have now been appointed from the sector to assist the minister in the Department of Sports and Arts and Culture. And a lot has happened in the last six weeks in trying to find a way forward that can look after our sector holistically, whether it be live events, conference, business events, uh, exhibitions and the likes thereof. And like Glenton said, we are aiming for fourth quarter, absolutely, but in reality is definitely more going to be first quarter of 2022, especially from a live perspective. And these are the channels and the routes that we're engaging with right now to see what we can do for long term. But the minister's exact words were, we need to look after the immediate term as well. And that's something that we've engaged with, which we can unpack a little later on. And one of those things is like Glenton is looking at vaccinations from a, a SACIA TPSA perspective, and this is where I'm sure Justin will come in, is where we are looking at rapid testing as being a medium, uh, a sh short to medium term solution for our industry. And these are all the bits and pieces that we engage with, with the Minister and the Department of Sports and Arts and Culture. And like I said, it's taken 332 days, but uh, success, persevere, it just goes to show perseverance does pay off. Absolutely, and you definitely need to have a lot of patience in this game that we've been playing for the past 332 days, right. for sure. Uh, Glenton, I'm gonna go back to you here now. I, there's been great talk recently, and I'm sure you've all heard about it in the media, about a lockdown that's coming now because of Easter. And as though many of people planning holidays and planning to get away and planning gatherings of sorts for the Easter weekend, uh, but yet there's this constant uh, note that's coming through the media 
of a lockdown, an impending lockdown. Some people say that the lockdown might be during the Easter weekend, a very severe lockdown, and some people saying, well, the Easter weekend will bring on the third wave and then the lockdown will happen towards the three weeks later. Can you give us some clarity there, maybe? So, so I smile because this is the stance that I think Sharif and I struggle with this in that we have information because we, we, have, we, we represent the sector uh, within this particular forum. So lockdown is, is probably the only mechanism that any government in the world can use um, to slow down the rate of infection. It doesn't help our sector. Um, so when we're sitting on these forums and one looks at the data available, the third wave is here already. What, what, we, what we are seeing is that obviously people are showing the signs, showing the symptoms, but not getting tested. Um, and then you're gonna see the spike going forward. Our, our challenge with government is the inability to make quick decisions. So when the data is looked at at a scientific level, the decision to lock down over Easter should have been made middle of February. Okay. Yes. So that it allows business and allows ourselves on a, on a citizen level to really plan better. So our sector needs quite a long runway for planning. What, what hasn't happened is, the, as I said, the effectiveness from government side. Now, that's not, no, no, um, no criticism on, on their side because just to give uh, you know, the audience and, and the viewers a sense of how decisions are made, every Tuesday, so it really starts from the Monday. So the Monday conversation happens that all of the um, different working groups, and I, I have the, the, well, I say the privilege of sitting on the TBCSA board and on the author Saki, and we're part of the working COVID group, which has got SATSA and FEDASA as well. So we'll sit on the Monday, we'll probably meet again this coming Monday, and we'll put together a position paper, a position plan to say, listen, this is the effect of a potential lockdown for Easter weekend. We did exactly the same over December. That then goes through the system, it goes to the National Command Center, it goes through NEDLAC, which then the TBCSA then presents, and then it gets to cabinet. And then cabinet met yesterday, so every Wednesday cabinet will meet. And then we'll get the president speaking on the weekend or the Thursday to say, listen, my fellow South Africans, we have consulted. So when they say consulted, everybody's been consulted. But it's sometimes, and, and this is something that, that, we, that we experienced on, on Boxing Day last year, sometimes the consultation happens so rapidly that decisions are made and the consequences are not considered as such. So when we talk about a lockdown, the consideration here is both an economic one but more so an, an issue on how we are also affecting the mental health of people. Because at the moment, any of us that want to have a break of Easter, you are in two minds to do exactly that. So just imagine at a business level for ourselves how difficult that is. What I can, can indicate is, and, and some of that has been already shared within the media, there are two schools of thought at the moment, which doesn't help. There's a school of thought that says, keep everything as is, but allow religious gatherings to take place. And, 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 I've, and I always say, and, and, and my family back home knows when the president comes on, I already know that the, within the three, first three paragraphs, the word gatherings is going to come. You know, and, and, I, and I cringe when I hear the word gatherings because I know the amount of work we've done behind the scenes to try and change the semantics, change the definitions, because it was really simplistic when the Disaster Management Act came into play last year to leave the word there. And, and by the time that we got to, to the Restart Expo, in November, through, through our own work, I then found out and progeny met the person, in, in, met the individual as well. We know exactly who the person is who writes the regulations. And we've tried as much as possible to change that definition because the definition hurts us on the basis that we are seen as any other gathering. Mm -hmm. and, and social gatherings, and, and I've said this to, to and, I, and I always use my family space as a, as a, as a yardstick and, and part of the, the sort of research to say that other behaviors or other people behaviors from other economic sectors affects our sector. So the behavior over, over December at the social level <clears throat> affected our sector because we're part of gatherings. So we go from 250, building momentum, boom, back to 50. Yeah. You go from 50 to 100, it just doesn't work. So I want to I tell the audience in front of me and online as well that we are aware of the fact that the indecisive of government, as much as we are providing them with information, a lot of the times, once, once it goes through the system, it's almost out of our hands. Yeah. And I use the word almost out of the hands because there are times that we are being able to win inside of those, those sort of conversations. But a lot of time, there's almost a, a process that I can get to the door, but I can't get inside to the room, let alone sit at the table of the meeting as such. So 
lockdown for Easter, as I said, two schools of thought at the moment. We're hoping that by the end of today or early tomorrow morning, some announcement is made. Um, but potentially, we either will go back to 50, um, or we're going to stay as is, and then we're going to have to prepare ourselves um, for a third wave, or effectively, what happened over December as well. Your, your feelings about that and affecting how it affects our industry? Well, it's like Lenvin says, there's two schools of thought here. If I, I wear the hat of uh, an industry eventing person, please don't lock us down. We know what we're doing. Um, we, uh, unfortunately, there are lives that are at stake here. And every little facet of the do's and the don'ts and the rights and the wrongs is taken care, care of. And like you said, it starts on a Sunday with the national joint uh, uh, committees of the different cabinets that get together, then get together with corporate, then get together with NEDLAC, and then get together with cabinet. So there's a whole chain that happens exactly what Glinton is saying with regards to what happens with the lockdown. Historically, last year, uh, we were locked down uh, for the 21 days anyway. And Easter weekend is a massive weekend um, from a religious perspective. Uh, of, from a gathering point of view. And this year is a little bit worse because you've got Passover and you've got Ramadan all happening at the same time. Mm -hmm. So it becomes quite tricky for government to make a proper decision. And I think it's more than likely it's going to go back to a, a, a gathering of 50 people. I even think curfews are going to be adjusted accordingly. Um, whether we'll actually change levels uh, is debatable, but we'll hear from, uh, from uh, presidency in that regard. But yeah, it's inevitable. We're going back to a lockdown. It's going to happen. How? It's, it's exactly what we've just been saying. Is it a good thing? I don't want to answer. <laughs> well, it's trying to find the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. For me, it's probably if we can avoid the third wave, if the lockdown is going to help us avoid the third wave, it helps prevent us from going backwards. You know, we need to move forward. Yeah. We move, need to move towards our goal of reopening. And if the lockdown helps us in that way, uh, and helps our industry, particularly being the forgotten industry, as we've all mentioned, uh, I think it would be great. While we're waiting for Justin coming, I, I would like to also echo what Glenton said earlier on, mm -hmm. was that we've got to try and get our foot further in the door to, to, differentiate, to differentiate between a social gathering and a business gathering. Um, and, 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 you know, from us all, we're working together, and you spoke about it in the beginning, and there's a one word I've always been in love with in South Africa, and that's Ubuntu. Mm -hmm. And I can't just speak for live events. You've got to speak to, for sporting. You've got to look at everything that looks at social co cohesion. And, but we've got to look at the difference of a business event, of the conference, and that <coughs> versus a live event, exactly. and how it can be channeled and, and controlled uh, so that we have got free of the, of the virus, but also control of who comes in and who doesn't come in. And this is why I can't wait for Justin to come in, because that rapid testing yes. component is going to be vitally important. Thank you. But speaking about the Lions Tour, so I know I was, I was speaking to Sharif about this earlier, and I think all of you as well, we saw it in the media, and it's a go for the Lions Tour. But the Lions Tour doesn't just happen. I mean, it brings in six to seven billion to the tourism industry. Um, as, as, a, at a, you know, as an event. Uh, so it's, that's a massive amount of money. But the Lions Tour doesn't come without spectators. I mean, what is the tour without spectators? So are spectators a go-ahead or not? I mean, that's part of the puzzle that we have, don't have as yet, right, uh, Sharif? Yeah, and, and, and it goes back to what Glenton was just saying and what you asked, is that cross-pollination from the government departments and the communication thereof, they've also realized now that there's a problem and that we need to find a solution and by virtue of a lobby group like the SA Events Council uh, uh, have been pulled together to make sure that the communication takes place and because of that they are now in agreement or susceptible to change and augmentation. Um, it's like the, a, a conference is a business event but it still falls under the Sassery Act when you're applying for jock applications, you know, that yes. type of scenario. Uh, so when you ask now about the British uh, the Lions Tour, um, yeah, we're all very excited because it will be the catalyst of things to happen for the rest of the eventing industry and business eventing industry. Mm -hmm. So we're obviously appreciative that the door has been opened there and that the workings behind the scenes via SASCOC and the Event Safety Council has done a lot in making sure that we can get this far. However, there's still a lot of work that still needs to be done. So, Glenton, I just want to go to you now. I know you've been working with uh, the Department of Tourism and what kind of 
input have you had from them? How keen are they on re us reopening? And what are they prepared to put out there in terms of helping our industry come online again? Okay. The, the, the first um, concern we had was obviously when the Department of Tourism released the relief fund. You know, there, there really you could see that there's a, there's a great need for us to work towards the department. Because obviously when you had looked at what type of businesses could get relief, mm -hmm. our sector was in there. You know, so that was, that was one of the sort of first things. I think the first letter we wrote was about, what's it, 25th? Yeah, 25th of March, 2020. Um, and I remember circulating it to, to a number of, of people um, in terms of giving them the sort of platform to do that. And that was a catalyst to get closer and get the understanding. The challenge we're always going to have with, with the department is when you say tourism, business events is part of it, but traditionally you'll think about tourism as a plane, a hired car, or a bus, a hotel, mm -hmm. an activity. Well, the business traveler does exactly the same. The difference there is the business traveler actually buys something. We actually engage it. So I'm not saying that the tourist doesn't buy anything. As such. So, so I think the appetite within the department is to help us structurally get this thing sorted out, um, to really look at how they've, how they've funded um, our sector in the past. A lot of times when we're hosting events or activities, it's not South African specific. So here's an opportunity that within the department, the, there's, there's an appetite to look for new exhibitions, new business conversations, new research platforms as well. Um, and, and it's a work in progress because we, we've been shifting their thinking with the help of, of, the, of the team we're working with to look at our sector more specifically and more dedicated. Now, what we, what we hope to ensure going forward, as I said earlier, in terms of South African Convention Bureau, is that that's our entry point. It's always been our entry point in the past, and legislation determines that the Convention Bureau is there, which goes to the fact that the other element that's happening within the department is obviously reviewing the, the, the tourism white paper, but also reviewing the legislation as well. So we, we're at the table. We have to then change the conversation points, manage the narrative going forward. I do believe, though, that there's still pro probably a little bit more work to be done. Yeah. I do believe there's more work to be done. I do believe that, that we need to still shout as loud as we can. We still need to lock the doors down. Uh, we have to persevere going forward. And as I said at the, at the onset of my introduction, I have empathy for, for the colleagues within the department. Uh, but they also know that that empathy has got a particular line that I'm not willing to cross because they've got a job to do on our behalf. I think we're very clear when we're speaking to, to various government departments that they hold the key to get our sector unlocked on a number of levels. So if they, if they drag in their feet, which sometimes they do do, it's about us again knocking the door down going forward. Yeah. So and you've definitely been at the table, that's for sure. And, and it's a work in progress, so it's really a twofold. One is that many of us want to get back to work. We want to do that. I think Sharif and I, and particularly yourself, progeny with, with, with Mike and, and the guys that have worked within those government spaces, we are, we are mindful of every time we, the camera goes on or the conversations start that we're not representing ourselves here. We're representing millions of people who have families who want to get back to work. Absolutely. And so, so, for, so for that part, the niceties at the beginning of the meeting were good, but we really have to punch the, the doors down and get that going. So, as I said, a work in progress, uh, but much more work to be done, definitely. Yeah. And, and the thing is, as a South African Event Council and, and with AXO being part of it, we hear you. Uh, we understand the frustration. Uh, and I know we have had various suggestions from, I know when you sit with your board and I sit with my board, there's various suggestions that come through. And these are campaigns that we're working together on, we would like to try, you will see lots coming forward, and we continue the conversation and drive the narrative when we sit at the table with government, as well as when we're in the media space. And to try and convince the South African public and South African business that it is safe for our events to go ahead. Now, I know Glenton has done a lot of work um, from a Saki perspective. They started with the, uh, um, the conferences last year, the our proof of concept conference. And that was to kickstart the engagement with government. That was followed by the Restart Expo, held in conjunction with the Johannesburg Expo Center and specialized exhibitions. Again, pushing the conversation and, uh, around the safety of our events and showing government how safe it is practically when you walk through those halls, when you attend a conference, 
the things that we can put in place to ensure the safety of the people that attend the events. And then I know from Sharif's perspective as well, they started, as you all will recall, a very big campaign that we started last year was the Light SA Red campaign. Let's talk about, you started with Light SA Red, right? That was one of the first big campaigns. We got lots of media coverage. And people keep saying, we need to educate the South African public. We keep talking to ourselves as an industry. And that is very true. We need to reach beyond our industry and educate the general public. And we need to educate general business that is out of our industry sector in order to come online again. So the Light SA Red campaign did just that because it reached everybody. Correct. And then your conversation started with the Department of Sports, Arts and Culture, am I right? So it actually started before that. You know, immediately when this happened, we realized that we're probably one of the strictest following of the law entities in this country because whether you're doing law a business, abiding, law citizens. abiding <laughs> citizens, whether you're doing a business event or a live event, you have to follow protocols and do applications and permits. And the Event Safety Council uh, came together and said, listen, the immediate thing that we need to take care of is a reopening guidelines that follows SASRIA and SANS 10366. And I think for the first two, three months, we all worked as a group of eight to 10 people that got together to put together these guidelines so that we could present to government um, our, uh, our suggestions to solution. And in the beginning stages, it fell on deaf ears. Uh, we sent it out to all different departments, right the way up the chain, all the way to NEDLAC and the, uh, the Command Council, yet to get any form of feedback from it. Uh, I then uh, took it on uh, myself personally to start communicating with the minister by a direct tweet every single night from day one of lockdown. And that tomorrow is 365 days of lockdown and 365 messages later. And as we came out of the 21 days and we saw there was no movement and there was nothing for our sector, it gave birth to the Light SA Red initiative, yep. which got the whole community uh, involved. And when I say community, it's not just live events, it was business events, it was actors, it was artists, it was even cultural people that sell arts and crafts. We got everybody involved just so that we can knock on government's door for them to hear our plea, our plight, and what have you. And it was on that day that we finally got recognition and as we were about to go live we got a call from the chief of staff of the department of sports and arts and culture and we started engaging so it has been a journey since then and anyway moving past that we carried on communicating trying to get the work done and like i said odd 30 odd days ago uh, i think the minister decided that he realized that he needs far more input from the sector directly and thus put together this advisory team so that we can start working closer with the department in trying to solve our challenges, which will speak not just to live events, but business and conferencing as well. And that's the journey that has been the last six weeks. So just so that you all know, you know, the, the, the goal that we're moving towards is reopening the industry. Correct. But whilst we're moving towards that goal, we know that businesses are struggling. We know that there is a great deal of unemployment within this industry. Yet these businesses and these individuals that are within this industry still have commitments. Correct. They are still psychological factors that affect you uh, during this process, having no work for over a year now. And the advisory committee, the advisory team, is responsible for that connection with the minister and his team but a little bit more than that, because I know you've got different work streams Correct. to assist individuals and companies within the sector. Correct. So um, over and above the reopening, which we're all working on, like you said, there are specific things that we need to take care of. And just to go through them broadly, one of the work streams is engagement with the retail and transport sectors. Uh, we have a lot of our freelancers across the board that still don't even have a plate of food. So. The, the minister has asked us to engage directly with high-end retail uh, shops, ShopRite, Spa, Pick and Pay, to engage to see how they can assist us in making sure that we are sustainable, at least from a food perspective. And then from a transport point of view, and obviously we're not talking about taxis and Uber and Bolt, but from a buses, mm -hmm. you know, engage with the Department of Transport, whether it be Putco, the Ria Via and whatever, you, to allow our people to get from point A to point B, whether it be from a business perspective or at least to go and see a loved one. 
And the, the final sector uh, uh, work stream is a big one. One is TERS. Uh, and, and uh, uh, obviously finding out from a sick code perspective and how we can adjust that. Secondly, and I don't know if anybody is aware of this, is that there are major challenges with COIDA, which is the letter of good standing from workman's compensation. Now, you need that document before you can walk into any business from a corporate perspective to try and lobby for that business, never mind going for a tender. And if you don't have a letter of good standing, they're not going to give you the work. And what the Workmen's Compensation or the Department of Labor are currently doing is irrelevant whether you've retrenched in your company or whether you've downscaled. They're working on 2019 figures and saying you will pay based on that, which is actually quite unfair because we've had no work for 2020 mm -hmm. and nothing for 2021. So that's an engagement with the Department of Labor because that's going to be the next big thing that's going to come mm -hmm. up uh, again. So it's that. Then coupled with that is the challenge that we have with landlords. Yep. Uh, where a lot of our people are staying in a rented home uh, and uh, are struggling to pay anything, if anything. And because of us not knowing the regulations or, or, or fearful of, of being kicked out, we are being intimidated by landlords and people to say, please leave the home, I can't have you there anymore, go out. And literally people are saying, go sleep on the streets. And yeah. I'm sorry, it's, it's, not, it's just not on. And the minister is very upset with that and wants to us to find solutions. And the lastly on that, because it's coupled to landlords, is banking. Yes. So whether you own a home and you've rented it out, or you own your home and you're staying in it, and obviously you haven't worked for 364 days, how are you paying your mortgage, your bond, your high purchase on your car, your loan agreement on your PA system, or your buses for tourism, or the likes thereof? So he's asked us to get engaged with the Banking Association of South Africa to try and find solutions and how we can resolve that. Now, these are the things that the minister has put together for this advisory team to look after in the immediate term. Like I said, there are short, medium and long term uh, suggestions that we're going to take place. Mm -hmm. But these are the things that he's looking after now whilst we're trying to fight the battle of reopening our sector. Yeah, so it's quite a holistic approach. Very much so. Very much so. and, and, and speaking about landlords, is that, does that include businesses as well? Absolutely includes businesses. If you look at Regulation 73 and 74 and you analyze it, it is quite clear under the Disaster Act how it helps both sides. And bottom line is this, from a business point of view, you cannot be evicted unless you've gone to court and you've had a discussion, and court has mitigated it. Court hasn't just issued a court order, right, go. He wants to hear both sides of the story. When it comes to rentals at home, the housing tribunal gets involved, but they're also doing the same thing. Under the Disaster Act, they're saying, listen, this is a freehold house. Mm -hmm. Come on, it's, you know, you, you can't be that cruel, you know, that type of scenario. Yeah. It's still work in process. We've still got a long way to go, but the beauty part of this advisory team coming from the sector is that we understand what we want as a sector. And we are speeding up the process and cutting out the red tape and bureaucracy that sits behind politicians. Uh, say, okay, I'll get to it and I'll phone you back or no, we're not interested in that. And this is where I take my hat off to the minister actually getting his hands dirty now in making sure we can triumph over these challenges. That sounds great. I think it's really, really positive feedback. I think the ministerial advisory team is a positive, a step in the right direction. Um, but obviously, we need a sense of urgency, right? Absolutely. And um, having the short, medium, and long-term goals are great, but right now, we have an industry that's dying, and like you're saying, people that need assistance, people that make up the industry, and we need to be helping them. So I hope you put the foot on the pedal and uh, get things going there, Sharif. Uh, Glendon, I know that you're also talking banking with Department of Tourism. I know you're addressing the issue there. Any feedback? So I think the, the challenges with, with banking, it's, it's probably my own personal experience um, needing something at the, at the bank, and I won't mention the bank, but they're the red <laughs> bank. Um, the red bank. Just needed something there, and, and it's, it's, the, it's the apathy, man. You know, it's, it's the person on the other side of the counter, it's the colleague across the table in the conversation. We, this is the rule, it was the rule before, um, and, I, and, and my response has been fairly, fairly simplistic how you perceive your position in society, irrespective of where you are, you cannot be sleeping under the table and not acknowledge that we're in a pandemic. Yeah. So I'm not saying we must break the law. I'm not saying that the rule book must be thrown out of the window. All I'm asking from the banking sector specifically, and this is part of the conversations we've had with him before, is understand 
the individual circumstances when you're speaking to them. Understand that. Because this is not a decision that any of us made, whether you are in business, out of business, wanting to attend the exam. Not a decision that we made last year this time to lock the country down. We did it because we want to save lives. Yeah. We're probably going to do it again over Easter weekend to save lives. We're not doing it because we purposely don't want to pay the bond or the car or the rent. We're not doing that. We also must then, 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 as I said before, understand that before we were locked down, a number of our sector and a number of our industry and, and our companies were working. Many of us were Medes Africa. Many of us had sort of forward-looking order books that looked fairly good. And I always say to the bank, so does that, that, does that historical data not matter? Mm. Because that historical data has always mattered when I needed more money. That's and I'm just asking again on a public platform that the conversation at a banking level has to be individually focused, but has to be focused on the sense that that person in front of you was a very good client before. Yes. And from, from what I recall from our discussions, the, the Department of Tourism is keen on assisting us Correct. in bringing Getting that back to the table so that those loans become available and that our sector is not red flagged Correct. every time somebody in our sector goes to the banks and they see yeah. that we're in the eventing industry. So that's a positive. Yeah. I'm so excited. Great to see you, Justin. Um, I see the sun is shining in your face there. Um, Beautiful afternoon in Cape Town. I understand it's extremely cold and unpleasant in Johannesburg. I won't rub that in at all. <laughs> well, don't worry, it's only going to be like that for a week. So um, it'll swap soon. <laughs> yes. Anyway, getting back to the important stuff that you are dealing with, um, I want you to tell us about Recharge, because Recharge started the ball rolling for, on your rapid testing journey. Yeah, that was December, December 21. So it was just uh, you know, it was a few days before the, the next the, the Christmas lockdown was announced. We, uh, we partnered with an Irish company that had developed some, some very interesting technology which we thought could have some application here in South Africa, which requires you to rapid test. And then based on that, your test results, you would then get a health passport or a health pass. And now, by now, I think everyone's read about this concept of a health pass, which allows you to travel, which allows you to return to events. We're seeing them in Israel and EU's just passed a green pass technology as well. And uh, we set out to test whether this could be used. And uh, we, we had about 250 people at our event in, in Cape Town at the, the lookout. Well, the lookout was our testing center, which is a few hundred meters away from our actual site, which was the Grand Cafe. So we invited a lot of stakeholders in the events industry, people who we, we thought could perhaps help us to stimulate the debate whether this could be a means for us to reopen the industry. And uh, we tested, you know, just over 500 people because we tested staff, but we obviously wanted to understand and get some insights into the clinical process. If this ever beca be becomes a viable way of opening the industry, how long does it take to test someone? You know, from the moment that you've registered, gone through the whole process, had the swab, you know, put it into the solution and got your results and updated, updated the information in the platform, how long does that all take? Because you obviously have to understand if you have to upscale that to 5,000 or 50,000 people, whatever number you need, what are the sort of operational processes and costs that you, that you need to implement? So the event was an enormous success. We, we had about 30 positive detections. And this was amongst people that had absolutely no idea that they were carrying the, the virus. We tested these people with... Uh, PCR just to confirm the results and we had a hundred percent confirmation from the PCR test that those that have tested positive with the rapid antigen test um, were indeed positive so there were no in our sample size there were no false positives we of course would never know if there were any false negatives you know we had our our second wave kicking shortly thereafter as everyone returned but that then created the framework for us to move into the next step to, to analyze and take a, a sort of decision whether this could be something that we could take forward. And we did, in fact. In February, we opened this testing center at, uh, at the lookout. We were still there. 
with the capability of testing up to 3,000 people per day, which means with the current regulations that within the 72-hour window before an event, we don't currently have those regulations, but that's where we're heading, we could test 9,000 people, which means in theory, we could have a safe event for up to 9,000 people observing social distancing at the CTICC or at the stadium or, or wherever ever it may be. So we've embarked on a roadshow. We've presented that to the Department of Health. We had the portfolio committee on tourism there the other day and overwhelmingly positive. We did an hour and a half presentation to all the honorable members. And within 24 hours, the portfolio committee came out with a press release saying that they're calling on government to support rapid testing and the health passport concept as a means to reopen the industry. So we're riding that wave at the moment. Uh, I could hear a little bit of what Glenton was, was saying about the British and Irish Lions Tour. We've noted the statements in the press about the financial impact that it will have for, for SA Rugby if there are no spectators. We've seen the media releases around the, the potential economic impact which is anywhere from six billion, if you ask Mike Schusler, up to eight billion, if you ask the Northwest University's Trees Department. And that sort of revenue between six and eight billion for the tourism sectors and the economy is a significant number. And I obviously can't talk on their behalf, but we're seeing rapid testing being deployed around the world as a means to open up events and industries. FIFA Club World Cup have just done it in Qatar. The Olympics are going to do it in Japan. The UK festival sector is opening up in July, August and September um, with a lot of rapid testing that's going to be done. Uh, so a very interesting field and certainly something which government's now well aware of and through the various associations what we're now trying to do is to is to put it in front of policymakers to say, give us the same runway as the tourism industry. So if you're allowed to come into South Africa with a 72 hour negative COVID test, give us the same runway in the events industry that we can open up at some sort of scale because 250 outdoors and 100 indoors is, is not scale. You know, no one can operate at that basis. And, and we really need that assistance now to open up to some sort of level. So very exciting and very fast moving area that we're busy uh, playing in at the moment. And Justin, what are your thoughts in terms of managing the logistics, obviously, with rapid testing? We know uh, those thousands of people that walk through our events. Um, it's exciting we're seeing them there, um, getting them through registration, getting them through, you know, uh, ticket sales. Uh, but now adding this additional element, um, how ha, has there been any thought about how the logistics of that could be managed? Well, yes, so there are two approaches to it. So the one is the centralized approach where it's something that is undertaken um, you know, by the event organizer. And I, I imagine that if something like the British and Irish Lions were given the go ahead uh, to have spectators that they would have some sort of centralized process like FIFA did in, in, in Doha. So you had a registration area. So if you had the vaccine or if you had COVID within a certain window before the tournament, you were then allowed to come and pick up your tickets at the registration desk or this registration center. If you arrived at this registration center, then they would, they would then verify that information. You would then get your ticket and accreditation. You could go in. If you didn't fall in that category, then you were then subjected to a test. And then you had to wait those 10 or 15 minutes in this registration center. And if you had a negative result, then you could proceed to collecting your tickets and your accreditation. Now, this is FIFA. Okay. So everyone's not FIFA. Everyone doesn't have FIFA's budgets and everyone's not doing World Cups. So what we ultimately envisage is a scenario where there is a decentralized testing systems where you can go to a pharmacy or a local doctor and, and you can have yourself tested and your results can be safely and securely stored in some sort of digital application where the only role then of the event organizer is to verify that information. So, for example, in Israel now, 
if you walk into entertainment facilities, they ask you to just open up your green pass and then they quickly check the, the status on your green pass. So it's literally to hold up the phone. It's either green or it's not green. And if it's green, you can come in. If it's not green, then you're not allowed entry. So that's the only thing that the, that the entertainment sector has to do today in Israel. And this is what is similarly happening in the EU. It's a very complex and costly exercise to run a centralized system. And we've had a lot of conversations with our colleagues about that. You know, it's, it's not realistic to say, you know, 150 Rand to come to a baby expo, but then on top you need to spend another 350 Rand on a rapid test. That's not gonna happen. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, the conversations with the Portfolio Committee on Tourism went into this direction of how are we going to fund this? And we said, well, ideally, ideally, in the absence of having a population that is vaccinated and having so-called herd immunity, we need to have some sort of funding mechanism between the event organizer, the event attendee, a corporate sponsor or partner, and the government. And of course, you know, these are just conversations, but the members very much expressed the view that it must be something that government should look at. Because if the government can aid the event sector or the tourism sector by subsidizing, you know, say a quarter of the rapid testing and, and it's split a quarter, 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 it means potentially at scale, it becomes 50 rand per, per individual player in that spectrum. Then it's not the end of the world. Then at least we can operate at some sort of scale as the vaccination program rolls out. But as we saw today, they're now saying February 2022. So for anyone willing to do events, wanting to do events at scale, that's now a red flag going, oh dear. So if we're going to pop, uh, vaccinate the public in phase three, hoping to end in February, then we're going to still be in this position for another year. So in the absence of that, the only logical solution for us right now is to open up with rapid testing. Yeah, well, I absolutely agree. I think we have to have as many solutions as possible and putting this on the table and being able to uh, work together with the Department of Health. I mean, it is being recognized by the World Health Organization. So that's a positive. And, and like you're saying, it's already being tried and tested overseas. Uh, and it will be interesting to see what case studies we can get in terms of watching the logistics and looking at how uh, the public take up is on it, an attendee take up as a whole on that. I would like if you obviously if you have any questions and you're online, please put it into the chat box and we'd like to address it soon. I'm going to take some questions in the audience as well. We've got a roving mic. Um, if anybody would like to have their voices heard and have some pertinent questions, our panel is absolutely willing to answer those questions. Um, so do let me know. What a beautiful setup. Well done, Dom. Well done, Neil. It looks really great. I'm sorry about the streaming, but I, I think we, the techies are sorting that out. Um, and I, it's just the times we're in. I mean, I've never been into anything without one or two technical glitches where we are at the moment. Um, just a comment, um, and I hear that we're engaging with government, and it's amazing, Sharif, what you've achieved um, in your organization, working with Kevin and Mike, and it's fantastic. We've got a seat at the table. And, and Glenton, we've got a seat at the table there from the tourism sector. But I, I just sense that we're running out of time. And, you know, I, I do sit on the events council, so here I'm talking from within, but I'm also talking from, you know, people in the industry. And I just get the sense that, you know, we, we're sort of losing hope. And, and I even look at the TERS process. You know, that TERS was from October 15 last year. Now, that is, you know, more than six months later, and people haven't got money. And we're still messing around with sick codes and stuff like that. So I don't, you know, and it's very easy for government. They're still getting paid and they're getting their salary and... You know, I, I, and there are people out there starving and there are people angry and, mm. you know, it's really rough. And, and I'm sure a lot of, of you have been uh, subjected to the anger. I certainly have on social media and various other platforms um, out there. And, and people just angry and, and, and tired. And, and I just feel it's taking too long. And how can we, and it's great you've got a seat at the table. But maybe we need, and this is quite a radical statement, you guys carry on with the seat at the table, but maybe we as an industry need to do something different, maybe a petition or something that's maybe not driven by you or what, but I'm just getting frustrated and we're going to run out of time. Our industry is collapsing. Uh, it's obliterated and it's going to collapse into nothing. Uh, and then we've got a problem. 
couldn't agree more. I think the reality as well, Justin, thank you for that, is, um, and I'm not sure whether government is getting that part of the picture, in that, you know, unlike the tobacco industry or the liquor industry, when they said you can open, you can open your shop tomorrow, right? And you can go ahead with business. But with our industry, you tell us that we can open tomorrow, it still is going to take us a few months before we can get our events going. It, the organization uh, takes time. It takes time to get your attendees on board. It gets time to get your exhibitors on board, you know, to plan your, your stands. There's, there's just so many elements. And I think there is that difficulty and that education that we're trying to um, process with our, our discussions with government. But I'd also like to add to, to what Justin's saying in that very often we have people that are asking the question, you know, can I get involved? What can I do? And I absolutely agree with you that our industry needs to take the bull by the horns and have their voices heard as well. So if you feel that the South African Events Council is not doing something, then you have every right with the high degree of frustration and the levels of starvation that we're experiencing, you have every right as an industry to get together in your own little group, whether it's a form of a petition or whatever action that you might deem necessary to take. By all means, you know, you don't just have to follow our campaigns. You might have a bright idea of your own that would have great merit. And I think the more we speak out, whether as associations or as individuals, it's important that we heard. It's important mm -hmm. that government hears us. And we're trying very, very hard. But we need each and every one of you. We need your support. So if you think of something, if you need our assistance, pitch it to us and maybe we can help you out. But if we can't help you out and you feel like you can do it in your own little group, why not? There is no stopping anybody. Um, it doesn't stop here with the South African Events Council. It doesn't stop with your association. You can take action. So I would really urge people, you know, to, to do whatever they have to do to make sure that this industry survives and that we can keep things going. What are your thoughts on that, gentlemen? So, so I know Sharif is going to say that we must get out and march. <laughs> because we've chatted about it before. Um, and, and, and there's nothing wrong in that. And, and, and I hear the frustration, Justin. Um, and it's a frustration in that if it doesn't hurt your back pocket, you're going to do nothing about it. Um, and then I think that's, that's, a, that's a comment that I know our colleagues that we speak to. Unfortunately, we have to speak to government, uh, as I said earlier. And, and I say that unfortunately because they, 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 they're the ones putting legislation to play. You know, if the prison comes online tomorrow or over the weekend, we go into lockdown, what do we do then? So litigation is an option. Um, parts of other conversations I've, I've been part of, there's enough, there's enough written already from a legal position to litigate against government um, for the sector. That is done there. The question we have to ask ourselves is, it costs money. It, it really costs money. Um, and I'm more than welcome to take the conversation offline because I've got a sense of what the litigation process would be, exactly where we would go to, and what that cost is going to be going forward. And I do, I do have empathy and, and I do agree. The longer we are in the current state of flux for the sector, the two things are happening. One, we are losing skill that we might never get back. Yeah. We might never get that skill back. The second is we, we're not even going to get new talent into the sector going forward. You know, and, and yeah, I'll highlight some of the conversations we had with the South African Convention Bureau, Amanda and her team. They're quite, they're quite concerned about that. You know, because the South African Convention Bureau, as we, as we all know, has spent a lot of money on bids for 2021 into 22. Some of those events are being cancelled now. Some events for December are being cancelled, which obviously hurts Destination South Africa. You know, so there you've got another willing partner to find a way of getting things done. What I've said to, uh, to a number of people around the country, um, and not to pick on the Western Cape, but the Western Cape, because they are seen as the tourism hub of South Africa, they speak out. Yes. They speak out aggressively, they get things done aggressively, and I'm not saying that we're not doing that aggressively. Maybe we're too polite about how we're going about things. But going out and marching is an option, 
litigation is definitely an option. What we need to consider, though, is are we in it for the long run? Because we cannot start it and then stop. Also, what we are also clear about, and I think Sharif will, will back me up here, is that we quite clear that the conversations we have in, we have in on behalf of the entire sector. It's not individual conversations we have in. Second to that is whoever we're talking to fully aware of the frustration. So the fact that, that Sharif and I will be probably in the front line with our picket and, and marching doesn't mean that the relationship that going back to the, to the board, boardroom or the, or the drawing board, that relation will be soured. Because there's only so much that we can expect government to do. And we, we're quite clear that there's not enough money in the fiscus to help us as well. So yes. something's got to give. I think in the, in the next quarter or the next couple of weeks, something's got to give for the sector. And the camel's back is going to break. It's, just, it's very simple um, for that part. So you know, welcome to take the conversation offline, um, Justin, and share some of the, the research and documentation that we've got on aspects we could consider, which we probably haven't considered you know, as a collective uh, from the SA Events Council side as well. Absolutely. Now, one positive thing, and I don't know whether this is a positive, but uh, a part of AXA, we have our venue committee, and I know Justin has been dealing with some of the big venues in um, the country as well. And the venue committee has been working with uh, the Department of Health, um, and they're working um, with uh, Discovery, and they are putting together proposals at this point in time to use our venues as vaccination centers. So that is a positive sign, Considering the fact that we hardly have much vaccines coming into the country, why would we need such massive venues, right? That would beg the question. Um, let's see if we have Justin. So do you have any feedback on the venue vaccination rollout for us? Yeah, look, so there are various streams that are ongoing at the moment. <clears throat> and, it, and it is a case of, and you see this in the news every single day, there is a massive shortage of vaccines in the world. The European Union is blocking exports. The other day, we couldn't get exports out of America that were part of the J&J uh, study. There is this vaccine nationalism that President Ramaphosa spoke about. And you saw just over the weekend that the EU blocked an AstraZeneca export out of, um, out of Italy that was due to go to the COVAX scheme that would have been distributed here in, in, in Africa and other low and middle income countries because of um, the lack of vaccines in the European Union. So what's probably going to happen is that when the vaccines arrive, they're all going to arrive roughly at the same time. And in order to, to prevent, and I don't think we're going to prevent third wave, uh, third wave, but to prevent that fourth wave, we are going to have to go in at scale. And scale as in 250 plus thousand to 350,000 per day. That's not going to be possible in your traditional healthcare sites. We just don't have enough doctors, we don't have enough hospitals, clinics, pharmacies, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to make a significant difference. And you're seeing this in North America, where over the past weekend, two days in a row, they vaccinated three million people a day, and they reached, I think, an all-time high of four and a half million people during the course of last week. It's because they've activated that what they call mass vaccination sites. And we're most definitely going to see the same here in South Africa, where conference centers and stadiums and arenas and malls and, and big facilities that are traditionally used for large gatherings are going to be repurposed into vaccination centers, which can take us from, you know, the 40, 50, 60,000 a day up to a quarter of a million a day which is what we need in order for this industry to open up. So definitely see that happening. And that's where we as the events industry are going to have to play a key role. Now is not the time to try and recover two years of losses by smoking you know, the government and the rest of the country with prices that are three, four times the rack rate. We need to look very carefully at our cost structures and try and, and assist and use our expertise, use our infrastructure to try and help government administer these vaccines, not for free. You know, I don't think anyone's expecting venues to open up their doors for free, but to look at time and uh, the time that you put in and the costs that you have to recover and put out fair pricing and really try and help, uh, you know, solve this national crisis.
Thank you so much, Justin. Um, yeah, so absolute, uh, our, our venues are, are, are key in terms of moving the vaccination schedule uh, a little bit faster. Obviously, it, with the speed of the vaccines arriving, uh, if it's going to be, a, I mean, like I said, I, I keep thinking if we're going to have these big venues made available, that's obviously a positive sign that something's happening in the background uh, with mass, uh, you know, influx of vaccines coming in. And as an industry, I think it's important that our venues uh, are getting involved. We, we thank them for getting involved because if it speeds up the process, it speeds up our reopening. And as you can see, everything we do is us moving towards that goal of reopening. Um, one more question that I have for Sharif, actually. Um, I know you've had great success, um, you know, with uh, the Department of Sport, Arts and Culture. Now, dealing with that particular team, how much involvement does the minister actually have in that directly? Or are you dealing with their DGs and deputy DGs? There's a lot of interaction. Uh, he's, he's very much involved uh, uh, in everything that we do. We don't meet with him constantly. Uh, it's uh, uh, every once a week we meet with him. Um, he has seconded uh, the DDG and hierarchy uh, 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 senior officials, as well as line officials for each work stream that we work dedicated with. And he insists on a report uh, globally from the complete team once a week. And, but over and above that, I speak to him at least once a day and give him a feedback report. So compared to this time last year when I was, we had nothing, it's a complete turnaround. Uh, uh, and, and we discuss over and above the work streams, we speak on various topics. One in point is definitely uh, rapid testing, uh, as well as uh, u usage of venues for rolling out of vaccines. And he has had a intimate discussion with uh, Minister Mkhize from the Department of Health offering his department by virtue, which would be venues and technical companies and the likes thereof, especially under phase three, uh, where we could be utilized to assist in rolling out of vaccinations. So like you said, you can see from the way Glenton is rolling in and the way Justin is working and the way the Event Safety Council is working and now with the Department of Sports and Arts and Culture, there is discussions happening constantly, work happening constantly and direct communication with the minister to which he's listening to. He hasn't just put this together and said, okay, do what you need to do and come back to me. He's actually hands on. And I'll be honest with you, he knows a lot more than we give him credit for. You know, it's a lot that we think that he doesn't know that we've given him a reopening guideline or Justin is busy with uh, uh, um, rapid testing. He knows by name who is involved on in it. So uh, I, I must say right in the beginning days, I was very much against and frustrated like everybody is in our sector, especially with the, the Minister of Arts and Culture. But I've, I've, I've learned and gained a new respect because he is actually very hands-on. And just going quickly, if you don't mind, to, to Justin Hawes, who spoke about how and what can we put our foot down on, what can we do? Um, yes, we, we, you know, our constitution allows for freedom of speech. So everybody's allowed to be vocal and say what they need to say. But it's exactly what Clinton says. If we want to go litigation, then we're going to have to go the whole 10 yards. Unlike liquor and unlike tobacco, our industry thrives on laws and regulations. I mean, as much as I want to go and march, my Lord will kick my backside. Because <laughs> we need to go apply to jock. We need to apply different permits and permissions in anything that we do in any event. And it's... We, we can't be recluse, we can't be reckless rather in what we want to do. Uh, so we have to think it through. And the work that we are doing now behind the scenes may seem arbitrary to the people that's looking on Facebook and social media and what have you, but the work that us as the events council are doing behind the scenes is a lot more than you would think. And I, I know everybody wants to happen now, but it will happen. Bearing in mind, if we compare ourselves to Europe, and I speak constantly to our counterparts in Germany and the UK, they're in the exact same position we are. Exact. Whether it be from hearing our voice, forgotten industry, reopening, gathering act. In, in fact, in the UK, their gathering bubble is only six people. And here we've got a hundred. Now, any way you look at it, that is a, an event, even the illegal events that's happening, but that's another <laughs> story for another day. So, 
the interaction with government is there. And I'm pretty sure Glendon can say the same thing because I know he's hands-on with a phone call with the Minister of Tourism as well. We are working at it. Unfortunately, it's not going to happen overnight. Glendon, do you think that the message is being conveyed to the top level from the ministries that we're dealing with? Do you think they are, we are able to get onto that agenda? We're on the agenda. It's the Department of Health. I think anything that anybody wants to do has to go through the Department of Health. Um, and and, and in, in fairness to the Department of Health, this is about saving lives. This is about saving lives. It's always been there from, from the onset. So the conversation is there, and that's exactly what we said earlier in terms of the, which is the schools, two schools of thought at the moment now around Easter week and lockdown, for instance. So if we can, and I think we, we're closer than what we, that we think uh, in terms of showing that to the rest of the, the sector, if we can get through the next two weeks and uh, with the work that the teams are doing in respect of the, the health and safety protocols, as I said earlier, something's got to give after that um, because it's really about getting through Easter and after that you've got quite a long runway before the next public holiday. Um, and yeah. for that, we've set ourselves up correctly. Now, it's, it's as, as Sharif said, me included as well. You know, I want to get out of the space that we're in to get to activity. Now, what's the solution? How do we get that? And, and part of that, that solution process is, is these sort of gatherings. I think as a sector, we need to start building that confidence in, smaller, in the smaller spaces, because that, that then speaks to our clients to get them to come in. And as, as we said earlier around the guidelines as well, the guidelines then become more specific to the different sectors as well, which I think will help a lot of planners um, and venues going forward. So I think our, our, big, our big push has to be to the Department of Health. I think an endorsement from the Minister of Health um, on the protocols um, is something that I think the team that is working with the Lions Tour is probably that catalyst that opens up a lot of things that we want to go forward. Very you know, so well. as much as I know other ministries uh, would, not, would not publicly say that, but that's really where the buck stops at the moment, um, is the team from a health perspective. And I know that part of the conversation I'm, uh, that, that, we, that we will look at at the TBCSA level is how do we start using the scientific viewpoints across the country um, to push into, um, into the conversation of opening up the sector far more wider than what it is at the moment. There's contact, as you can see. I mean, we've had contact uh, with the Department of Health, uh, them being able to open and to come to view the rapid testing facilities and to see how that works. You've got contact with the Department of Tourism, uh, with the Department of Sports, Arts and Culture. Um, and like Glenton is saying as well, and I'd like to urge everyone as at this point, is that yes, our capacity indoors is 100, but we need to urge all our event organizers to try to host events within this capacity. I know it not, might not be ideal for all uh, uh, events right now, but as many as we can host. And through hosting these events, we can ha get this industry to start working again, slowly. And by hosting these events, we demonstrate the safety protocols. We can have all the proof of concepts we can do, but it's the real events, it's the actual events that work with particular industry sectors that need to start happening. You know, engaging with your clients, making them feel confident to come out and host their little conferences that cater to 100. And once people see that this is happening, those numbers will start to lift because the confidence will build and government will be able to see that these events can be hosted safely and it can be hosted with larger numbers. But we all have to play our part in this. Gentlemen, I just would like to say a very big thank you to all of you. Um, if there are no more questions from the audience, any more questions? Ah, oh, we've got to. Justin, I'm going to give somebody else a chance before I give it to you. Is that all right? Thank you. Hi. Glenton, I know earlier on you mentioned regarding the codes for tours and that it is they are trying to sort it out, but some of the members that are not able to catch this session online are asking if we know when that would be sorted out. Is there a time frame? Is there a week? Is there a month? Is there a date, a second, us, I believe? Joe, um, my response is that it should have happened already. Um, cause two Saturdays ago, we worked over the weekend. Um, so when I say we worked over the weekend, the team that I'm, that I'm part of to, to help the, the UFTA's online team to get that sorted out. So I know SATSA 
um, and I spoke to David Frost before I came online. They released some information last week um, that gave you insight in terms of what, what was supposed to happen, which wasn't necessarily for public knowledge, but I think that's David's, David's frustration um, more, than, than, more than myself in terms of my frustration as well. I'm hoping that I can, and I think on, on some of the other groups I speak about, I hope that by the time I go to bed this evening, there's like a little note that says the system's updated, go back online um, to assist as such. So it's, it's part of what, what, what Justin Hawes was saying is that we, you know, we get to the door, somebody else has to do the work and I'll be off now. Uh, which sort of looks as, as if we haven't done anything. And I always feel that way, like we do so much work, but it, there's no like, okay, it's now done type of thing. So it should have happened already. Because as I said earlier, the sick goes depending on how the company was registered versus what SARS is, all of that was sorted out with the drop down boxes and support information. And then there was a communique that I was gonna to circulate to all the associations to say, listen, just be aware that there is also a question that says if there's a need for the association just to you know, verify that this is a company that works in, in our sector as well. So that was sorted out a couple of weeks ago. Why the system hasn't gone live? We don't have an answer for that. Um, so hoping again before I go to bed tonight, I'll have an answer. But it's, it's that level of frustration where our level of importance is sometimes not felt by, by colleagues um, inside the government system, unfortunately. Thanks, Justin. Just a comment, you know, if you look at the world, um, you've got Australia and New Zealand and they've been able to contain things and they've done it through isolation. And if you look at Japan, China, India, um, events are happening there. Um, and in Dubai, there were some events, there's a big food event recently. And, you know, we, we keep looking to Europe and, you know, Europe's, uh, you know, Europe's a nan they're nanny states there. That's, they have, you know, they, they look after their people. They've got uh, pension funds. They've got provident funds. They've got uh, 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 health schemes and all that sort of thing. And, and I just think, you know, I think we're looking at the, in, the, in the wrong way. So, you know, as a, as a comment, and I heard you, Sharif, you know, we're looking at our colleagues in Europe and stuff. And why aren't we looking to India, for instance? And we're also developing a, a country. Why are we look at China? I mean, look at Japan. I mean, what, what Dubai, uh, you know, uh, what, uh, UAE. I mean, it's just bizarre. Phenomenal. I, I don't know if you want to answer that. Yeah, just yeah. a comment. <laughs> I, I, I actually do. <laughs> Um, uh, so I, I'd like to say, you know, based on just to go what, what, what Progeny spoke about, our responsibility belongs to us. It's, you know, it's up to us to make sure our industry works. And I just like to let everybody know, it is not up to the Department of Tourism or the Department of Sports and Arts and Culture to make a decision. It belongs in the National Co Corona Command Council. They make the ultimate decision based on input that they get from the Department of Health. So it's up to us to be responsible, because if we're not, it goes all the way up and then the command council turns around and says, you see, that's why we don't want to lift the Gathering Act. So responsibility is key. Number two is, Justin, you are 20 million percent correct. I was having a conversation yesterday with Kavir on the exact same thing. We're a member of BRICS. Why aren't we using Russian vaccinations? Why aren't we using Chinese vaccinations or their systems so that we can get back to work? And they've now realized that that is the case. Unfortunately, and I'm sorry I can get into trouble for this, our government, every time we get to play a role, we turn around and say, hold on, okay, America, what are you doing? Europe, what are you doing? And it's wrong. It's absolutely wrong. We should be working with our colleagues in BRICS to make things work for us. You spoke about Australia, New Zealand, and what have you. We were doing an event, supposed to take place tomorrow, in Mauritius because they were completely open. Not even a week ago, Mauritius was shut down completely. For how many people? 20, something like that. They're following the right protocols to dip it in the butt immediately. And what system are they following? The Chinese and the Indian. So we need to learn from our members in BRICS. And I can be wrapped over the knuckles for this from government. Minister probably will give me a call later. But it's a fact. And I agree with you. That's way, the way we should be going. Sorry. Yep, no, a fair discussion there. I think there's a lot happening on that side of the world um, in more ways than we can imagine uh, successful stories uh, that we can learn from, for sure. Um, and uh, it, it, you know, they, they're way ahead of us in many ways. And we need to learn and we need to be able to bring it home to South Africa so that we can start getting into business again. Final thoughts is that we, we, need, we, 
to get back to work, we need to build confidence. And I just want to reiterate the fact that for now, smaller meetings, more regular meetings. In addition to that is with our colleagues from the South African National Convention Bureau, and I'm giving them a plug, the bid support program is potentially where we could assist. So they've got, they've got the bid support pro program as well as the hybrid um, program for support for companies to bid, come on board with your, uh, with your activities and events. So the, there's little small baby steps being taken to assist industry to get back into fold. And I think the, the, the final sort of takeaway for, for, this, for the conversation is that it's frustrating. I, I, fully, I fully understand. I fully agree with you. The challenge for us is how do we collectively get ourselves through this? We got ourselves thus far because we did a couple of things right. We communicate regularly, yeah. whether it's good or bad. We frank, have frank conversations like this, you know, which effectively means that we've remained connected. And because we remain connected, we've been able to collaborate um, as associations, as an industry. And, and the only sort of last point that's missing there now is we need to build sustainable confidence um, in getting ourselves back to, uh, to work again. Um, and thanks to everybody that's, that's been behind the scenes, helping us, urging us along to get to this particular point um, in this journey thus far. Yep, because we certainly haven't been doing it alone, <laughs> that's for sure. Sharif? Yeah, I think um, the creation of the SA Events Council, in hindsight, was the most brilliant piece of movement that we've done for our sector. It's brought us all together, it's created unity, and it's created a voice loud enough that government has eventually heard to make sure that we are not the forgotten industry. And now with our catchphrase moving forward, we can afford to turn around and say, government, trust us. We can make it work and you can rely on us to look after our government and our people. And the people that are working behind the scenes, you need to give us the opportunity to make sure that we're working for everybody in the sector. Uh, just before I got here, I was spoken to Sharif, please speak about the National Arts Council and the plight of the artists and the likes thereof. And, and yes, but the artists are not alone. It's the actors, it's the tech teams, it's the sound engineers, it's the security, it's the safety. It's every member of the value chain that contributes to the 1.414 million people in our sector and the 2% to the GDP. And I mean, that number is in the billions. So we are here trying to make it work and we encourage everybody to hold hands with us uh, so that we can make sure you understand what we're doing so we can make sure our event world opens. And uh, information uh, webinars like these I think are vitally important because people need to know the work that we're doing behind the scenes. Definitely, thank you very much. And to all of you that attended today, thank you so much for your time. I know it's a conversation that is going to keep going for weeks to come. And it's a conversation that's not going to end when we reopen, because this collaboration allows us a platform to engage as an industry as a whole, a platform that we've never had before. And we're grateful that it's been created and that it allows many discussions that will happen after we fight and work towards this common goal that we're working towards right now, which is our reopening this platform will continue, will continue to engage. But like I said, please let your voice be heard. Uh, we all have a voice, we all have an opinion. And it is important that your opinion and your voice be heard. Whether you address it with us, or whether you take on a personal stance as a company, as a group, as an individual, it is important that you are heard. And the more voices that get out there, the stronger our voices together. If you're not following us on social media, please do so. Any of our associations or the South African Events Council, always tag us if you are putting out this, anything that's important that will be relevant for our industry, whether it be case studies, whether it be way forwards, so that we can share as an industry as well. We will do this again, and hopefully next time we'll be closer to the goal, um, but we need to continue fighting the good fight. Thank you so much for all of you that joined us online and at the Ticket Pro Dome today. Thank you to the Ticket Pro Dome for allowing us the use of the venue. And thank you very much to my panelists, Justin, Sharif, and Glenton for joining the conversation today. We know we will continue the conversation and we'll ensure that we share as much information as we can with you whenever we have that. Um, thank you very much and do have a great evening.